Hey kids, it's Jurassic James, and if this Jurassic James explains what we're looking at, or Nisropods. Now, the Theratopsians were my other group video where I went over the horned dinosaurs and how we break them down by different groups. I thought to do the same thing for Nisropods. The word for Nisropod means bird foot, because long necks, sauropods leave footprints, theropods, the predators leave footprints. The next bigger group known for that are the Nisropods. We find a lot of their footprints of them walking along beaches and things. Well, beaches back then, not now. Uh, they're often just rock hill faces. But one thing to point out too is that the horned dinosaurs, the ceratopsians, and the armored dinosaurs, the stegosaurs, and ankylosaurs, they leave less footprints. So that's why the name Anisopod is associated with these guys here. Now, first I want to point out with the with them on my video, I have a link below, and it'll show you like the different on my website, different different groups. I actually have many of these individuals picked for those purposes and their name, where they're from, and all that. But the big picture with Anisopods are, are that there's two main groups. Starting here, on this side are the hadrosaurs, which are commonly called duckledinosaurs, uh, because there are beaks like you know duck-like bills, for some of them, and the iguanodonts are these guys here, which iguanodon being the first dinosaur in this group named the second dinosaur name period. The first was Megalosaurus, second dinosaur name was iguanodon, and the idea behind that was Gregor Mendel saw a tooth that looked like an iguana tooth, which are herbivores, but he said, well, it's way bigger than any modern iguana, so therefore it's iguanodon, some big giant reptile from the past. This is not his interpretation of the animal. It was literally a big giant iguana, <laughs> but the, the name stuck because it was scientifically the first one of its type, and it came on all the way through to today. Now, everyone you're seeing in this little group here are a form of iguanodon. Now, iguanodon itself initially became a, 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 a catch-all, like a group taxon, where anything that had that body plan was grown in that genus. We now know that iguanodon is the genus, but also a species, a, a family, basically, a type of animal. So, for example, one animal that was once thought to be a guanodon, the Andalosaurus, has been renamed, it's a new model of it, which is kind of weird how it was renamed toy, just like that, you know. But we can't get toys of certain figures because of whatever reason. The main thing is, uh, it essentially has the same traits we have in this guy, but it's, it's, it's different location, different features, enough to be its own species. But what iguanodons have, they can kind of stand out, in my opinion, are their hands. They have five digit hands, they have three toes to walk on, a pinky for grabbing leaves, and usually a thumb spike for fighting a defense, we believe. So these guys are, are that. Now, there's one in Australia, and this is again, early, early Cretaceous for the most part, named Mudiburosaurus, after the town found down there. And it was made famous in Walking with Dinosaurs. It was in the Australian scenes. That was a big duckbill looking thing. It's, in, it's a Mudiburosaurus. Uh, they depict them having little sacks in their nose, a honk. Another one not cousin from the Jurassic period is in Jurassic World, but this that actually, the, the Calavasaurus. So again, uh, very cool animal. I was happy I bought three of them. But in North America, we have two other types. One is this guy here, which is uh, Camptosaurus, which is a Jurassic iguanodont. So again, this will be an ancestral or possible ancestor to the iguanodont themselves. And this other one is the most, I think the second most famous iguanodont, Tenatosaurus. It's called that because the tendons in his tail are really large, and his tail in general is almost as long, long or equally the size of his whole body. Um, they're known for being the favorite food of Dionicus, the raptors. Whenever you see a picture of one of these guys that are being attacked by Dionicus because they find Dionicus bite marks on their bones, basically. So the, this one and Iguanodon are really, really popular. Now, the lesser known members of this group, and it's a pod, are these guys here. So one of them that people know, may have heard of is Hypsilopodont. So this dinosaur is like a sheep. The dinosaur is a sheep. They're small from Britain. Um, they're so small, they don't stay on the visuals. They just have this little you know, pack group here. Uh, one also this really, really this is the only one I can find of Dryosaurus. There are a different branch, uh, separate from the iguanodonts, and uh, they're not to the scale. They're not like giants. They're actually about would be like this, about tall the man almost, or a little shorter than the human average human. Um, it's actually a squeaky toy, but the idea is that these guys are bipedal, and there's some found in North America, and there's some found in Europe, and some found in Africa actually. Uh, so they're a really cool group. I will tell you on my own personal, this guy here, I don't know. And on my website, it's blank. I don't know. I think it's a, I, I classify it as a Hypsilophodon. <laughs> I have no idea what this is supposed to be. Because a lot of these little dinosaurs like uh, Hypsilophodon, Drinker, Othelia, Othelosaurus, they all have the same kind of body plan. So I'm not sure what they intend this guy to be. I bought it in a mall. It was one of those like, little packs of little hollow cheap dinosaurs. And I just was wondering. And if any of you know, please comment and tell me what you think it could be. Uh, but anyway, so those are the Iguanodonts and their covens. Now, Oranosaurus uh, from North Africa was thought to be an Iguanodon. For a long time and now recent research looking at anatomy said it's probably something between iguanodons and hadrosaurs not that it like they evolved into like that but just it has traits somewhere in the hadrosaur side so it's often classified as a, as a hadrosaur form 
But beyond that, we have what's called the duck bills. Now, I must tell you that, that Dr. Bakker does not like the term duck bill because it only applies to a few individuals in this, in this group. But it's stuck in a public, popular mind. So if I use a term, people go, oh, yeah, those things. The proper term for them are called hadrosaurs. The reason it's so important is the first dinosaur found in North America was a hadrosaurus. In fact, it was the first dinosaur found that we had proof could walk on two legs. Uh, Iguanodon and, and Megalosaurus, when they were first found, they are both actually could walk on two legs, but the bones they found didn't suggest that. So when we go to hadrosaurus, the arms are way too short for the animal to walk on all four. So they were like, this is a bipedal animal, and that changed paleontology, right? Anyway, so the most famous member of this group, I would say, as far as the name and features, is Montosaurus, its most abundant fossil uh, hadrosaur found. And one thing to point out is that there's one found, too, in the same strata called Ananotitan, which means duck, gi giant duck, basically. Uh, recent papers have said, actually, Ananotitan is a species of Montosaurus. So this, as the genus goes, this guy's gone. The, what we found of his remains are actually a, a branch of this guy's uh, sub subspecies, or no, species. Um, Greptosaurus here, very beautiful model of this guy here. So in hadrosaur world, there are like two branches. There are the Lambiosaurus, the ones with a hollow crest, and the solid or node cresters right there, right here. And these guys, as I said, they have either node crest or little bitty ridges. Uh, Myosaurus has a small crest right there on, on, on the uh, two little bumps over the eyes. And the idea is that Myosaurus is the first dinosaur with a feminine name, meaning good mother lizard, because in the 70s, Jack Horner and company found Myosaurus in their nest. Uh, yes, we found Protoceratops eggs and over after eggs in Mongolia in the 20s, but this was like the animals, the nest is there and the fo animals fossilized next to it. Pretty, pretty cool, right? Uh, the other group of hadrosaurs are called the Lambiosaurus. And Lambiosaurus, this guy here, who I call Middenhead, because like a midden, it has this little like thing on its crest. Um, it's the most well known, well, one of the earlier known for scientists. And the idea here with this feature is that um, the hadrosaurus with crest all had certain crest designs. And we now know too, they're also hollow. So back in the 70s and 80s, they would just take, like they didn't make models of the crest and blow air into them, but we're in the 21st century now, so they just scan a skull, reconstruct parts of it, and they blow digital air, and it makes the honking noise it could make. Now, that in and of itself is cool, but it's not hard, hard science in that there's a lot of soft tissue going on, and the idea is that, yes, the crest could make that noise, but how does the crest, how does the soft tissue affect that? And what I'm saying is that for dinosaurs, like one of my undergrad senior papers was um, I mentioned some cool facts in the dinosaur group, and one of them was hadrosaurs and sound. And they're the only dinosaurs who have an idea of what they sound like, because all the dinosaurs, the soft tissue would have been, you know, like in their throat, basically, like, like a like a voice, not a voice box. They can't talk, but honking noise like that. Hadrosaurs have these hollow crests that can blow air. That most likely would have been used to communicate to some degree. But the idea is, again, there's soft tissue in there that we don't have, and we can't say exactly how it sounds. It's a general idea of how it sounds. Kind of like how when they have those mummies, they'll take a mummy and they'll scan it and they'll go, oh, it's, if you know, if you know, eh, like they can make that noise it makes because they see enough of the soft tissue to scan and reproduce that. It's kind of like that, but there's more to it than that, of course. Uh, Hypacrosaurus here, really cool. And so this is the only model of an Hypacrosaurus I can find. And this guy here is the baby. And we found so many adult babies and juveniles and sub adults and all that, that they've done uh, studies of their development over time. So for many dinosaurs, you know, we find adult specimen or a few specimen or we find, you know, to find a baby is big enough, but to find enough to see the changes over time, it's a really big deal. We can then look at growth rates and things like that. And some hadrosaurs are what we consider sexually mature. They can have children by four years old, but they may not be done growing physically until they're like in their like 10 years old. Now you say, what's, what's the big deal with that? Well, first of all, uh, humans can reproduce like 15 or 16, but we don't until like we're 18 or whatever uh, for the most part. And then you don't really stop growing in some ways here, 18 or 25, depending on what part of your body. So that's what we're seeing happening here. Um, in evolution, the, the goal is to reproduce yourself, your species, so for them to be able to reproduce so young, uh, and you can't say four years old, it's like a sizable animal, it's, like a, it's not little like us, you know. Uh, its cousin, close cousin, is called Charisosaurus. This is my second favorite hadrosaur, because Charisosaurus has his helmet, and his skull means, I'm oh, sorry, its name means helmet lizard, but it reminds me of the Corinthians, uh, or, you know, the Greeks, they have like these helmets, right? That's not as exaggerated, but that's what you're seeing happening here. And they're also depicted in Jurassic uh, Park 3, with Parasaurolophus, the most, my favorite, and the most, I think, well-known or most observed hadrosaurus ever, known for a six-foot crest here. Uh, despite being so popular, these guys are actually relatively um, not obscure. There's not a whole lot of skeletons of them, actually, compared to, like, Edmontosaurus duckbills, you know. Name after Edmonton, Canada, if you're wondering. Uh, but the idea is that these are the most popular of the hadrosaurs um, in, in general. Uh, there are some, and hadrosaurs in general are known from North America, Europe, and Asia. They're entirely Northern Hemisphere. 
So what's going on is that when Pangea forms, uh, it breaks in half. In the top half, the uh, Lorraine towards North America, Europe, and Asia, it's all one continent. And the bottom half is Gondwana, which is Africa, South America, India, Australia, Antarctica, and uh, New Zealand, you know. And so that these whatever the duckbill ancestor was, they were up in the northern hemisphere and it became the hadrosaurs. The Iguanodontia, again, mentioning Australia and others, they've been found in the southern hemisphere every now and then, but they're mainly found in the north as well. So the idea is that, that, that knowing the plecatonics explains dinosaur distribution, kind of an important part. That being said, we have these two species from Asia, Centaurosaurus, and this one, uh, it actually means um, swan lizard. So it, these models are not to scale for the most part. I try to pick some close to scale, but the idea is that they would have been just as big as this guy, you know, the same size. Uh, but the idea here with these two is that um, I think with more, not form, but more, I mean, you get T-Rex every year, Triceratops every year, the toy of it, but these kind of like lesser known species, they make smaller models, so they're not sure. But meanwhile, if you go to anywhere in Asia, you can buy, go to their toy stores, and you'll see bigger models because that's their local species. Kind of like how we get a Parasaurolophus, you know, a lot of times and many toy toy brands. But in general, what we're seeing is that there's these major groups, the iguanodonts, the hadrosaurs. Within hadrosaur, we have phthalates, nodocrests, and then holocrests, and of course, the hypsilophodonts and, and their relatives. Um, again, if you know what this guy is, please let me know in the comments because I I, I think on the website I put hypsilophodon because this is the most famous of this, these small dinosaurs, but uh, I'm just really curious of what the, in, the company intended for it to be. Because a lot of times the companies will say, oh, it's this animal, and they really think it's this animal and they're wrong. But in this case, I think they had an idea they want it. And I'm just being, maybe I'm nitpicking it too much because out of every creature I have here, I don't know what this one is. <laughs> so it's kind of, kind of upsetting. Anyway, so that's our interpods in general. Again, it's a link below. If you think these videos are great, let me know. Tell me, do this topic, whatever. Uh, share with your friends uh, so the algorithm can know to like let people know this is a possibility. Because I can talk over any topic if you want. Just let me know. That being said, thank you very much.